Hi. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks for having me in this program. Uh, this paper, The Fractured Land Hypothesis, uh, it's uh, co-authored with Jesus Fernandez uh, from UPenn, Mark Koyama uh, from GMU, and Yu Hong Lin uh, from Guangdong uh, uh, School of Foreign Studies. So Yu Hong is in the panel today. Uh, so maybe he can help uh, take some questions later. Okay. Uh, one. Okay. So our paper is motivated essentially by uh, the patterns that you see in this diagram. So if we compare China and Europe between AD 0 and uh, 1800, what we see is that often, or most of the time, you see China being unified, having like one regime controlling China, whereas in Europe, you see a lot more regimes. Note that the y-axis, the number of states, uh, is in log scale. So uh, the actual difference is much bigger uh, than, than what you see from this program. So we want to understand why. Why do we see this program? And perhaps another question that we can think about is why do we care? So it is important, uh, at least to economic historians, because uh, many economic historians actually believe that uh, if you see industrial re uh, revolution in Western Europe, it's actually because of their competitive uh, state system. Uh, like this argument was, was made as early as Montesquieu. Uh, Eric Jones, Joe Mokia, and most recently, uh, Walter uh, Schindel actually uh, made similar arguments uh, from different perspectives. But effect, uh, effectively, if you trace to the root, it is arguing about competitive states' economic development. So there are also a lot of uh, discussion about how China's comparative failure in economic development, at least in the pre-modern age, was due to the fact that it had a centralized empire for a long time. I'm sure you're familiar with these kinds of arguments. So we think that understanding why we tend to see or we often see political fragmentation in Europe and centralization in, in China might actually teach us something about the origins of economic growth. But uh, I'd like to emphasize that you do not need to embrace this idea that a polycentric state system was behind Europe's growth to, to, uh, to I think, appreciate the question. I think this question, why China was often unified, uh, whereas in the case of Europe, uh, you don't often see a unified empire. In fact, you can argue that you only see it once or zero, uh, zero times in history. I think it by itself is an important uh, question to understand. Okay, so we in this paper, what we're trying to do is to test the fractured land hypothesis. So what is the uh, fractured land hypothesis? The idea uh, can be traceable to uh, David Hume, uh, this English philosopher. Uh, most recently, Gerard Diamond made this argument uh, in his uh, 1997 book, very famous one, Guns, Gems and Steel and also in a follow-up paper in Nature. Uh, basically, what he argued is that fractured land, such as uh, mountain ranges, dense forests, and so on and so forth, they impeded the development of large empires in Europe uh, compared to the rest of Eurasia. So this argument is not without controversy. For example, Phil Hoffman have actually shown in a paper that uh, China was in fact more mountainous than, than uh, Europe. Uh, similar arguments were made by uh, uh, Peter Turchin, by Green. Uh, there is also other arguments that, uh, that, that uh, uh, propose that China's unification is a contingent uh, outcome. So, for example, the book by Victoria Hui about uh, China's unification under Qin, uh, like during the Warring State period. So, we see a lot of debate in this issue, in these issues, uh, but uh, a lot of these arguments are not assessed uh, quantitatively, and this is what we want to do. We think this is important because, for example, if you think about the Roman Empire, uh, if you are for, sorry, if you are against uh, Diamond's argument, you can uh, claim that the Roman Empire prove that diamond is wrong because you do see a huge empire uh, emerging in Europe uh, in history. If you are for uh, diamond's argument, you can actually claim that 
because you only see it once, actually that could just be a fluke uh, event. So, uh, so basically, whatever you see in history, you can argue it in both ways. So we think it's important uh, to assess uh, these arguments uh, quantitatively, and this is what we seek to do. So just one uh, map showing the ruggedness of China and Europe, just to uh, further elaborate on Phil Hoffman's point. So if you look at this map, which shows ruggedness or standard uh, deviation in elevation, you do see that uh, China seems to be more rugged than uh, Europe in terms of terrain. Uh, however, there is one interesting thing, which is this North China Plain. What you see is that uh, the rugged areas in China tends to be quite concentrated in certain parts. And the flat areas uh, tend to be, uh, again, concentrated in, in, the uh, in North China or like uh, the central plain to the Chinese. So this is going to play an important role in uh, what we see uh, in the results later, so just a preview. So what do we do? We build a dynamic spatial model of state formation for Eurasia uh, between 1000 uh, BCE to 1500 uh, CE or 1500 AD. Uh, so we stop at the time of the age of discovery because from then onwards, sea power becomes a lot more important. And then our model, at least at this stage, uh, we do not look too much into uh, like sea naval investment. So what we do is that we focus on Eurasia, so uh, Europe, Asia, and the northern part of Africa. And we're going to divide Eurasia into small grid cells, into hexagons. And then what we do is that for every cell, we're going to provide information uh, on their topology, on climate and productivity. And then what we do next is to allow these cells to engage in interstate uh, competition as well as intrastate competition. And this is going to cause states to expand most of the time and sometimes to contract. And then we want to observe like how, how uh, these states interact. Uh, of course, the expansion and contraction will depend on the characteristics of each cell. Uh, of each cell. And then uh, what we do is to simulate the model multiple times and see for most of the time, uh, what are the trends. So uh, let me just go straight into one simulation. I think uh, it becomes a lot clearer and then I'll provide details about how we do it later. So what we do is to divide Eurasia. So this is Eurasia, here is China, and this is Europe, I'm sure you're familiar. So into multiple cells, uh, every cell uh, is a hexagon. So some looks bigger here because I'm not exactly starting at time equals to zero. This first uh, slide is time equals to 10. So you already see some cells uh, like bigger than others. But over time, right, they are going to interact. And then you see states uh, becoming, some states becoming larger, others being annexed. So for this simulation, what you see is that you see a unified China, you see unification in India, uh, Europe tends to be fragmented, uh, but in this, uh, in this case, you see a, a, a state that controls pretty much uh, France and, and uh, Germany. Uh, so what we do is to run multiple simulations with different uh, parameter values, and then uh, see what are the trends that we see. So we allow randomness in, in the model. So let me. So, Chong Wei. Yeah, so, please. Uh, so, this is very interesting, but I'm wondering if the model can uh, also explain, say, dynasties uh, in China, you know. So, it seems that the key point is, is the relative size of, uh, of, uh, of playing. Uh, mm. You know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a kind of summary statistics. But think about once, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, ethnic minority uh, mm -hmm. took over this, uh, you know, central part of uh, China. And the model, can the model somehow explain, uh, 
it can be kind of defeated by people from the south. Uh, uh, okay, I hope to convince you by the end of this this uh, presentation that yes, we can do that. But okay. but but uh, so so we can't of course uh, precisely predict uh, why it was the the munch. I mean, why why it was uh, was was for example say. Uh, Zhu Yuanzhang that unified China and built the Ming Dynasty instead of Zhang Shicheng, for example. But we do, I think our model does allow us to talk about like where uh, in China unified um, empires are likely to emerge first. So I hope to convince you uh, on that. And the other thing is that uh, we also, I think our models also have something to say about dynastic cycles. You'll see in the extension uh, later. So let me just first go into the result. So our result uh, actually shows us that, uh, at least in, in our baseline setting, uh, that fractured land provides a robust explanation for the pol political divergence that we see uh, at the two ends of Eurasia. We tend to see often in China, a unified China, in Europe, a fragmented uh, continent. And what we find is that there are two sufficient mechanisms uh, to drive this result. And you just need one of them uh, for this result to come out. So if you remember the cells that you see uh, in the last slides, if we provide the cells with topography information, so each cell has its current, like its, uh, its topography information, and then we let uh, cells interact, you're going to see a unified China and a fragmented euro. Alternatively, suppose we ignore completely uh, information on topography, but we provide information on productivity. You're going to same, see the same result. Unified China divided Europe. To some extent, if you think about top topography and uh, productivity, they are correlated. Uh, so, so in some sense, at the higher ground, we're essentially talking about the same thing. Uh, what we find is that it's only when we neutralize both topography and productivity that Europe and China tends to uh, move at the same pace towards uh, political, like some degree of political unification, but uh, some low degree of political unification. So we do a lot of robustness tests uh, to, to, to uh, check these results, and we find that uh, actually uh, the results are fairly uh, robust. One thing that we like to uh, emphasize is that what we think is that this model actually leaves us uh, plenty of room for extension. So for example, we don't really explicitly think about culture in this model, but we can actually uh, model culture. We can uh, model religion and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and I think things will be clearer uh, once you see how our results are, are generated. Okay, so yeah, please. In your framework, how would you think of a lot of disconnectedness was endogenous to infrastructure like the Grand Canal connected uh, the Yangtze River Delta and the Huang River Delta, where the Roman Empire, if they built a lot of canals, they might also get more unified. Uh, how do you think of this? Uh, is that well, For example, uh, if we think about the Grand Canal, so in the model, right, we didn't actually have the Grand Canal in the model. So we only look at natural terrain. But uh, if we want to study uh, the Grand Canal, actually that can be done because all we need, right, is to feed the cells along the Grand Canal uh, with information on the Grand Canal. So it's the same thing. So let's assume that we want to think about, like, what if, what if like the Romans built a lot of canals? Suppose that this can be done. Actually, if you think about the terrain, I think it's much harder. And that's why you don't see uh, can canals, like, like long canals emerging in Europe, I think. Uh, but suppose that uh, we want to see this, we can actually build counterfactuals in the model. So in that sense, I think the model is fairly elastic, not elastic in terms of the results, but elastic in uh, what, what uh, we can do. Because basically it's just about changing information in the cells. Uh, yeah, so uh, what we do, uh, we think about, again, Europe, uh, Asia, and Northern Africa. So all in all, we okay, have to... Uh, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, following uh, Rishi's question, I think that mm. she's talking about the, the uh, endogenous response of the, 
of these natural barriers, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the dense forests uh, in Germany, mm -hmm. was a obstacle for Roman Empire, but the the desert disappeared. You know, so Le these uh, okay. na natural so barriers can uh, change mm -hmm. because of human. So we activities. don't. Okay. So so to. Uh, the short answer is that for now we don't have endogenous response uh, but we can actually uh, allow like the the model we can actually use it to build counterfactuals uh, the issue about forest i'll come to it uh, actually fairly soon so uh, just bear with me for a while so uh, just uh, a bit of details on what we do in the simulation that you see just now we divide Eurasia into more than 20,000 cells. Each cell has a radius of uh, hexagons, uh, to, be, uh, to, to be precise. Each uh, hexagon has a radius of 28 uh, kilometers. Why 28 kilometers? Because that's the distance that an army marches a day. Like the, the, that's the standard rate. If you look at uh, military manuals, that's, uh, that's what you see. Uh, why hexagon? Because we want to divide Eurasia into polygons that uh, regular in size uh, that covers the entire uh, Eurasia and also that are uh, mutually exclusive. So a hexagon is the most sophisticated uh, polygon that you can think about, one with the most size. So uh, we try with squares as well, the results are, uh, are similar. So each cell uh, at time equals to zero, which we interpret as 1000 uh, BCE, uh, is an independent uh, polity. And over time, uh, a, co a conflict can take place between two adjacent cells. If the two cells belong to different polities or regimes, then they are going to fight. And then fighting will either in, uh, result in one uh, conquering the other, the other conquering the first one, or uh, 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 like uh, no result. That means uh, no side, uh, no annexation. So if the two cells belong to the same polity, uh, most likely nothing happens, but in our model, we allow a secession to happen. So sometimes uh, cells can break away. So the probability of a war leading to annexation is going to be higher than secession in our model, but of course we can change the parameter value uh, to alter this. Uh, so the outcomes of conflicts depends on productivity and uh, geographical characteristics, and you will see later that uh, the geographical characteristic topology, uh, sorry, topography seems to uh, matter most. Okay, so this is our study area. This is the yeah. area that until 1500, most people uh, live or like at least most historical uh, recorded history happens. So this is China. We are taking China south of the Great Wall and then uh, east of the Tibetan Plateau. So these are natural boundaries. For Europe, it's harder to, to draw a natural boundary of Europe. We can go as far as the Ural Mountains. Uh, we decide to use Hechner, the Hechner line. So that's a traditional uh, division of Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Why we do that? It's because we want, actually, we, actually, we want Europe to be of the same size as China. So the Hechner line, uh, it's, it's a natural, uh, I mean, it's, it's a natural choice. Uh, the other thing is that under this division, Europe is going to be slightly smaller than China. So in that sense, we don't bias the results uh, against Europe because we're going to use her Pindal index to measure the degree of unification. So uh, the larger uh, the entity is, the harder it, uh, it is to achieve a higher uh, her Pindal index. So this is uh, Europe or Western Europe, this is China or China proper. So we're going to measure the, uh, like uh, compute the degree of unifications uh, for these two uh, subcontinents. Okay, so uh, we divide, as I said, uh, Eurasia into cells. Each cell carry three information. Effectively, this is the most important thing uh, in what we do. Uh, each cell, so think about cell K, it has six neighbors. So it is. Uh, so every cell is characterized by three info, three pieces of information. First, spatial location, where the cell is and uh, what are its neighbors. First thing. Second thing is about productivity, and then the third thing are geographical attributes or geographical obstacles. So I'm going to talk a bit more about productivity and geographical obstacles uh, right now. 
So productivity. For our baseline model, we are going to use estimated population in 0 CE, uh, used in height 3.2. Uh, this is a data by uh, people who do environmental science. Uh, 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 this, this is a set of uh, data produced by uh, scholars, environmental scientists in Netherlands uh, and widely used in the science literature. So uh, why population? Because uh, if you think about the Malthusian world, the period they were studying, it's the Malthusian period. Population is good uh, estimation of resources, but uh, we are going to uh, use alternative measures to check that the results are robust. So we are going to use uh, one alternative measures that, uh, measure that we use is agricultural suitability. This is modern agricultural suitability. Uh, uh, provided by uh, Rama Kruti at all. And then another one that we use is potential caloric yield uh, provided by uh, Galore and Ozark, the one before the uh, Colombian exchange. So this is the productivity uh, information that we're going to feed into the cells. Okay, so, so uh, just to show you the product, uh, population density, in AD0. So we see that uh, in China, you do see some kind of, of uh, like higher population density than elsewhere, except for example, uh, India and Europe. Uh, in Europe, you see that Italy is densely populated. You, actually, you also see Egypt and surprisingly at the time, uh, some parts of North Africa being uh, productive. That's actually uh, going to be important if we think about the emergence of the Roman Empire. Okay. Okay, the other information that we're going to feed into the cells are the geographical attributes or obstacles. So the most important one would be terrain ruggedness. Uh, other information uh, would include whether the cell is a sea channel. So a cell that connects, for example, uh, England with uh, continental Europe. Uh, another information that we're going to fit in is whether cell K is a frigid cell. So frigid by, def by our definition means below freezing for six months or more in 8,000 BCE. Why 8,000 BCE? Uh, because that's known to be a relatively warm period uh, in history. So uh, another information, whether the cell is torrid, uh, whether it's in the tropics. Uh, so frigid and uh, torrid, the terms we borrowed from Aristotle. And then the last thing, uh, which gets back to Yifan's question, is whether the cell is part of the uh, ancient forest of Central and Northern Europe. So we don't consider uh, forests elsewhere, but we only consider uh, forests in uh, Europe. And uh, let me show you first the ruggedness first, and then I'll come back to the issue, the question on forest. So this is uh, the ruggedness uh, like distribution in Eurasia. You see that China is fairly rugged, but again, you see a plain in North China. Uh, in the case of Europe, uh, you see the Pyrenees, the Alps, and uh, the Carpathian divide like cutting in some sense Europe into like uh, different like several equal sized regions. In the case of China you see one big region and the, the other ones are relatively small. Okay. Okay, so this is the distribution of the torrid cells. Sorry, the the frigid cells, the torrid cells, and then the central uh, European forests. So why do we uh, single out Central European forests? Because there's actually quite a bit of discussion among historians about the uh, uniqueness of Central uh, European forests. Uh, okay, so compared to forests in uh, North America and uh, East Asia, Central European forests are uh, dominated by hardwood species, for example, oaks, for example, beeches and uh, birches that could not be cleared with primitive tools. So the Roman historian Tuxetus uh, described Germania or present-day Germany as a land that is effectively covered by forests and swamps and uh, it makes uh, Germany hard to attack. 
In fact, uh, Julius Caesar wrote about this as well. So as late as 1700, 40% of Germany uh, remained forested. I think in 60, 1600, the percentage is 60%. Uh, there's actually a geographical reason to this, uh, why Central European forests tends to be uh, comprised of like hardwood species and then uh, the, 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 the trunks are harder than uh, the trees that you can find elsewhere. The reason is because uh, during periods of glace, uh, glaciation, uh, what happens is that forests can move, they tend to move to warmer areas. In the case of Europe, the forests can't move south because of the existence of the Pyrenees, the Alps, uh, the Carpathians, and uh, to some extent, uh, Mediterranean Sea as well. So what you see in Europe is that trees were especially uh, cold resistant and especially hot. So for this reason, we want to include this into uh, our model. But in the model, as you will see later, we take it out just to make sure that this is not uh, driving the result. Or it, it adds to the result, but it um, does not uh, drive the result. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, just another proof that forests uh, are, were important in European history. If you read a lot of fairy tales, the Little Red Riding Hood, uh, that's Xiao Hong Mao, uh, Hansen and Gretel, I don't know what's the, the Chinese name. In fact, if you look at Snow White as well, I mean, these stories, they were all, uh, they all originated from Germany. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of forests in Germany, even as late as uh, early modern period. Okay, so I've described to you what uh, information we feed into the cells. The cell has spatial information, uh, geographical obstacles value, and uh, productivity. Now I'm going to explain how the cells interact, and then uh, the rest uh, of the paper would act uh, will, will actually look fairly straightforward. So consider this situation that somehow we have two regimes, where, uh, or polities, polity I, which is in pink, and polity J, which is in blue. And polity I controls K and polity J controls K over line. And in this period, uh, a random event occurs. There is conflict at, along this border between K and K over line. So they fight. So fighting will result in one of three outcomes. Regime or polity I conquering K over line. That's the first outcome. The second possible outcome, regime J, control uh, concurring k or the third outcome nothing happens so no annexation so the outcome will depend on uh, three things first the resources controlled by regime i so this is the big yi the big yi is simply the summation of the productivities of all cells controlled by regime i or polity i uh, it will also be dependent on the uh, excuse me, resources controlled by regime J. Uh, again, the, res the, the resources of every cell uh, controlled by J. And then it will depend on the local terrain of K and K over line. So the more obstacles they are, the more likely that we are going to see no annexation happening. So uh, that's essentially how the contest function looks like. It's effectively a, a modified uh, TULOC function. So we can actually uh, enrich this contest by including information, for example, on religion, culture, uh, technology, and so on and so forth. Okay, okay uh, just a brief, yeah, please. So, so the, the way that you model conflict here is yeah. essentially every time a border has a conflict, the whole, economy of the two politics are mobilized to fight and then that determines mm -hmm. the of winning yes Which strike me as like sort of another version seems to be i mean this wouldn't be sort of the, this would be identical for small politics but for large politics mm -hmm. it seems like a lot of the warfare on the on, on the peripherals doesn't involve the central government per se it's just that the, the peripheral population are very different belonging to politics a and b and it just sort of you know some marginal contribution mm -hmm. from the local from the from the from the government can can strike the balance of them belonging one or the other. 
mm-hmm. how much how much of the, the this relies on you need to have the entire sum of the of the productivity to be contributed to the warfare or you just having sort of a, a um, you know the, the local local oh, productivity yeah. yeah okay so uh, the the okay so in our model uh, in our simulation actually if you see a large quality emerge over time right then what happened is that actually in every period the large quality is going to fight several wars because uh, everything is random and then uh, and then it's most likely going to fight several wars so uh, what we do is to divide uh, resources according to uh, the strengths of the enemy so to some extent uh, it's a reduced form way to achieve what you say but um, I think expli- okay, we have not we, we, we did not do that, but I think we can actually do that uh, by allowing resources that uh, so if it's a large quality, only uh, cells within a certain distance can supply uh, resources uh, to fight this war. I think that should be uh, that, that's doable for sure. Uh, I don't think it will uh, affect the result by much. As I said, because uh, in our simulations, what we see is that like large qualities, they don't, uh, for every period, they don't just fight one war. They fight uh, multiple wars. Yeah. Because you okay. Mentioned- oh, sorry. Yeah, Richard. Mm. Perhaps because you emphasize the German- Germanic and the Tacitus, just remind mm. you, it just makes me think like the decline of a Roman Empire is partly mm-hmm. driven by the Germanic invasion, right? That's a mm-hmm. big change. Yet, mm-hmm. the Germanic population has much less resources, as you're emphasizing. Uh, mm-hmm. This kind of outcome is one of your outcomes, or is an outlier? Okay, so uh, we, okay, in one of the, ex- in, in the baseline model, we don't consider, uh, like, uh, like, the barbaric tribes. Uh, in one of the extension, we actually allow step uh, cells to fight better. So in some sense, uh, what we want to do is to build a model as simple as possible, and then see whether we can replicate the, the result that we see, uh, the patterns that we see in history. And then uh, for the parts that we can't, uh, we try to add more and more and more into the, the, the uh, model and see what is the sufficient uh, mechanism like that that would drive the result. So uh, as I said, there are a lot of things that uh, that we have done, but there's a lot of things that we could have done, but we don't do because right now the paper is already fairly bloated. But uh, it's something that we can we can uh, address in the model. Yeah. Okay. So just a very brief note on secession. We allow uh, border cells to uh, like either uh, we allow border cells to uh, break away from their parent regime. So uh, very simply, uh, we assume that uh, secession is, uh, is more likely to happen if the cell, the border cell, has high obstacle value. So if it's, for example, very rugged, it's easier for you to uh, break away and defend yourself against the central regime. So uh, that's one possibility. Another is if the regime is big, then uh, border secession is going to happen uh, with higher probability. The third uh, factor would be that if the parent regime has an odd shape, so for example, it's super long, like uh, think, about, think about Chile. So uh, if it has an odd, odd shape, then it's more likely to uh, break away, uh, like border cells are more likely to break away, whereas if it has a compact shape, then uh, secession is less likely to happen. Uh, so, but the in the model, we we actually allow secession to happen only with a very small probability, because we find that once we increase that, we're going to bias the result really against you. So uh, just uh, to recap, so at t equals to zero, every cell is a separate polity, and then uh, and each in each period, the cells has a random probability of fighting. Uh, and then if they fight, uh, the outcome is, this, uh, is, is uh, decided by the contest function. Uh, so a, a, a war can end up with uh, conquest or no conquest. And then this was what I said just now. A polity may fight no war, one war or multiple wars at, every, uh, at any period. 
if it fights multiple war, then it's going to split its resources propor uh, proportionally according to the resources of its uh, opponents. And then we allow uh, secession to take place. Okay, so that's the uh, basic model. So parameter values, we draw these parameter values from people uh, from like in the discipline of operational uh, research. Uh, they look at wars, how they were fought, and then they come up with some numbers. So we borrow their ideas. So uh, these are the parameter values that uh, we insert in the model. Uh, but what we do in the paper is that we play around with these uh, parameter values. So what we find is that when we change these values, it's going to obviously uh, change the speed of unification, but uh, it's always the case that uh, China unifies uh, faster than Europe in the baseline when we change the uh, parameter values. Okay, so just to show you, so this is a picture of just one simulation. In period 50, we already see an emergence of a polity, a relatively large polity in China. Actually, you see the same in uh, North India as well. Whereas Europe remains fairly fragmented. This is again just one simulation. This is period 300, China proper effectively uh, unified. This is period 500. So if we think about one period as five years, so that typical, uh, like 500 periods covers 2,500 years. Okay, so instead of just one simulation, because we have randomness in the model, so this can just be fluke, what we do is for every simulation we run, uh, for every specification, we run 49 simulation. This is the heat map of our benchmark model, baseline model. Uh, when we run 49 uh, simulation, we see that by three, like t equals to 300, China proper is usually uh, unified by that. In the case of Europe, uh, at t equals to 300, uh, the Herpendahl index is below 0 0.2. At t equals to 500, uh, it's about 0 0.2. So what does, does it mean to have a Herpendahl index of 0 0.2? It means that if you think about five states of relatively equal size dividing Europe, then uh, you're going to get a Herpendahl index of 0 0.2. So effectively, England, France, uh, Germany, Italy, Spain. So uh, it could be a coincidence, but then uh, it's a nice uh, result to report uh, for our purpose. Okay, so why do we often see uh, China unifying? So what we find from the result, uh, North China plays a, an important role. So this is North China. It's true that China was significantly more mountainous uh, than Europe. So China was covered by uh, hills. 37% of China was co covered by hills uh, compared to 10% in Europe. But the locations of China is such that uh, it still allows China to have a huge play. And this plane is very close to the lower Yangtze and the middle Yangtze that somehow uh, allows like uh, the early emergence of a large polity. And once a large polity is formed here, then the remaining areas can't block China from expanding until the ruggedness uh, effect becomes so big or the uh, secession effects become so big that China stops expanding. So we know from uh, like Chinese geography that if you think about the Wei River, the Yellow River, the Huai River, the Middle and Lower Yangtze Rivers, they actually, uh, sorry, the Yangtze River, they're fairly close to uh, one another by European standards. Okay, uh, sorry. Okay, so just to show you, right, about uh, the, the, the unification of China. So this is our benchmark model when we run 49 times. This are the, so we're going to see China unifying, uh, in fact, uh, in all 49 times, I believe. And this is the uh, cell that eventually unify China. We see a lot in North China. We see a lot in Lower Yangtze and uh, one in, in, in uh, Northwest China and one in uh, middle Yangtze. So this is the benchmark result. Uh, later in our extension, we actually allow steppe. Uh, so steppe is the grassland in Mongolia. 
So if we allow stem cells to have uh, like better chance of winning wars, then we're going to see a lot of all these like red cells here, like the red brackets here, moving to North China and uh, some to Northwest China. So like I thought the result is fairly cool because I mean, if you think about China, for example, during spring and autumn periods, right? You actually see the Southern regimes being able to fight the Northern regimes. You have the Chu, Wu, Yue, and so on and so forth. But once uh, horses becomes an asset in war, people know how to use it, then often you don't see Southern regimes uh, challenging Northern regimes anymore. You tend to see unification from the North. Uh, so I thought the result is fairly cool. Why do I keep getting back to this? Okay, so just a, 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 a table on how often China was uh, unified from the north. The only outlier here is the Ming Dynasty. Uh, uh, during uh, the, the 14th century, they unified from Lower Yangtze. In fact, that was a time when gunpowder uh, was increasingly used already. Tell me, you have five minutes. Okay, sure. Okay, so I don't like basically you get a, uh, a good idea of what we do now. I just want to show you some of the sensitivity analysis that we have, uh, that, that we have carried out. So the baseline is the benchmark. Uh, the table, uh, the figure here, right, basically plots the medium plot. So for every uh, specification, we run the, the, the specification 49 times. And then we compute the median Herfindahl index at every period. That's how we plot this graph. And then we see that in the baseline, uh, China unifies much faster than uh, Europe. So what we do is, so in case you're worried that forest is driving the result, so for uh, B, right, what we do is that we close down the effect of forest for torrid and uh, frigid. So temp a uh, temperature goes away as well, there are effects. So only ruggedness and productivity matters here. And we see, still see China unifying much faster than Europe. For C, remember that our cells right, contain two information, productivity and, and geographical obstacles. So we close down everything in geographical obstacles, including ruggedness. We see that Europe is going to unif uh, unify much faster, but still China is, is ahead in terms of unification. Okay, other, sense, uh, other tests that we do, uh, for, uh, so we restore the value of uh, the, the geographical obstacles. And what we do here, right, is that we multiply European cells, their productivities by two, just to see whether like, uh, this can affect the results. Actually, uh, we don't see uh, the results being changed. Uh, for part E, we have the, uh, so cells have information on on uh, obstacle, uh, their ge geographical obstacles, but we let every cell have the same population density, the median population density. We still see China unifying faster than Europe. It is only in F when we close down both uh, productivity and ruggedness and other geographical obstacles that we see uh, the same pace of unification in China and Europe. So uh, that's the uh, main conclusion that we have from our uh, model. So we uh, so uh, for this uh, slide, right? What you see is that we replace y, uh, the the productivity information, with uh, crop suitability index, with uh, potential caloric yield, with population in one thousand BC, so one thousand years before uh, zero AD and also with population in 500 CE. And our results are fairly uh, robust. Okay. Uh, okay, so other extensions that we do, we give uh, European steps, uh, like the, the, the cells in Mongolia, and also the cells in Ukraine, and so on and so forth, uh, a larger chance of winning wars. Uh, we consider the role of rivers. Uh, in our baseline model, rivers plays no effect, but we know that rivers facilitate transportation up and downstream, and it creates uh, obstacles to cross uh, on left and right banks, so we allow for that. Uh, and then uh, what we do, uh, in the another extension that we do, is to allow Mediterranean Sea to be a cell itself that you can cross. 
Uh, we also think about like what happens when there's sh random shocks uh, that uh, regimes break up. So let me just uh, show you. If we consider the step, we don't get uh, China unifies faster actually, uh, but then we don't see a fundamental change in the uh, the basic outcome. Reverse doesn't change the outcome as well. So Mediterranean Sea. What we see is that once we allow Mediterranean Sea to be transversible, then you don't see Europe unifying uh, quickly, but you do see a Mediterranean empire unifying fairly quickly. However, making Mediterranean Sea transversible is not the only like it does not seem to be on the only factor that uh, that plays a role in in uh, Roman the emergence of Rome. Because if we change the productivity information to 1000 BC, then we do not see uh, a Mediterranean empire emerging anymore. So if you look at the right figure. And I think what this thing tells us is that uh, you are Roman, uh, the Roman empire is unique. And probably uh, the, warm, the warm period that, in, uh, that, that was there during the time of Rome actually plays an important role. So uh, this is also in line with uh, what historians have been telling us that uh, during the Roman period, the Mediterranean Sea was exceptionally warm and North Africa was actually relatively productive in terms of agriculture. But once uh, the, like the, the warm period turns into a relatively cold period, and once North Africa uh, experienced uh, desertification and so on and so forth, then you do not see a repeat of the Roman Empire in history anymore. So, uh, so let me skip this. Uh, we allow for shocks, uh, for example, Little Ice Age, and so on and so forth. And then we, uh, we, so we allow regimes to break up and see how they react. And then uh, we do see like more like cycles in China rather than uh, in, in Europe. So this was uh, related to Song Zheng's question. So let me just conclude because I think I'm running over time. So basically, we just we built a, a, a simple model of spatial uh, like interaction and competition, and then we consider the role of uh, topography and productivity in generating uni uh, political unification in China, persistent uh, political fragmentation in Europe, and we find that either factor is a sufficient condition uh, to generate, at least in the context of our model to, to gener generate the patterns that we see uh, in the second slide that I show you. And uh, what we want to argue is that uh, this framework actually is fairly simple, but we can add a lot of things into the model uh, to test extensions that you may be interested uh, to, to, to look into. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry for going over time. Um, that's all for my presentation. I think uh, we are running out of time, but let's take one question, okay? Uh, any question from the panelists? Uh, Hong Hanwei. Uh, mm. Hey, Hanwei, can you talk? Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, in your motivating figure, uh, actually, you see the number of states in Europe rising. So, our fragmentation actually increased over time, but it seems that. Your results still show that the, the, the fragmentation in Europe actually goes down over time. So, uh, how to explain the rising number of states in Europe? You mean the fragmentation going yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. up over time? Uh, actually, that's something that I have not uh, thought about. Uh, let me think about this. Yeah, I don't have a good answer here, uh, except that. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and because another, we do and, see, yeah. Okay, and another question is, um, so you okay, see, so, 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 okay, okay, can I? Uh, I, I think I do have a, okay, a, sure. a, a an answer. Sorry. Uh, actually, I think it's because of the way we compute uh, this 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 uh, figure, because we compute this figure by assuming that. Uh, so what we meant by states are sovereign states. So if I'm a feudal lord uh, that that uh, 
acknowledges the sovereignty of my king, then I am not counted as a state. So if we consider feudal lords as a separate regime, then I think uh, what we should see here is what we see in, this, uh, in our simulation. Yeah. So because if you think about feudalism, uh, there's an argument about whether, like, if you see a feudal kingdom, is that one kingdom or is it multiple kingdom? Because every feudal lord, they claim uh, they're the residual claimant of their, their domain. I think that that should partly answer the question. Sorry, uh, your your second question, I disrupted. Okay, uh, Hanwei. Hanwei, yeah. Oh, yeah, we, Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, mm. it seems to take a very conflicting uh, view between states, though they only can compete uh, and fight wars, but maybe they also trade with each other, and maybe Northern China uh, unify because mm. it's a plan uh, that people trade a lot and so they have lots of common interests so they become friends as they trade more with each yes, other yes yes that is that is true yeah so uh, actually i i don't deny that our our model it's it's very simplistic so what we can do for example is to allow uh state the cells to have memory so for example if they were formerly in some uh like in unification before, and even now if they break up, they still remember that they were unified before. And when they fight a war, it's more likely for unification to take place. I think that is something that there's a pot potential ex uh, extension from our model. Or we can actually think about, uh, for example, China as regions, uh, cells in the same region, when they, like, when they fight, they're more likely to unify. I mean, we think about like, fighting as fighting, but it could just be a negotiation of, of, of two cells, and then eventually two cells becomes one. 